Welcome to Breathe, a podcast series by the Africa Biodiversity Collaborative Group, that's ABCG, where we take you on a captivating journey into the world of Africa's biodiversity conservation. In this podcast, we strive to be at the forefront of biodiversity conservation efforts, delving into the intricacies of Africa's diverse ecosystems, extraordinary wildlife, and unparalleled landscapes. Our aim is to shed light on the pressing issues facing Africa's biodiversity, ignite action, and foster collaborations that bring about effective solutions. Join us as we engage with leading experts passionate conservationists and local communities who work tirelessly to safeguard Africa's natural heritage. Whether you're a nature enthusiast, scientist, policymaker, or simply curious about the environment, this podcast is tailor-made for you. Together, let's embark on a journey to understand, protect, and celebrate the immense beauty and irreplaceable natural heritage of Africa. In this episode, our topic for discussion is Achieving Peaceful Human-Wildlife Coexistence. Joining us today are two distinguished guests. We have Mr. Ken Muathe, who is a Policy, Climate and Communications Coordinator at BirdLife Africa, who will give his thoughts on a peaceful human-wildlife coexistence, especially with regards to birds. And we also have Mr. Steve Ogutu, the Executive Director at Movement for Community-Led Development Kenya, that's MCLD Kenya, who will shed light on the crucial role communities play in preserving our environment. I'm your host, Laban Clifford Serio, and Karibuni Sana to Ken and Steve to our podcast, Breathe. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here with you, Laban. Uh, thank you for having me on this uh, podcast. I'd like to start with you, Ken. Uh, how did you become a bad life expert? Thanks, Laban. I mean, uh, I grew up in the, in the, in the village and that for Wildlife was uh, was always part of my life. Uh, listening to birds in the morning, and only later did I learn that some of those what the names of such uh, some of those birds, the common bulbul. I'm sure mo- some you know some of you or most of you in the morning will have had that bird. If you Google it up, you you you'll be able to to see it or even listen to it to its call. Um, the olive thrush, the the sunbirds, and the and the house sparrows and and, and others. And therefore, wildlife was, was always part of, uh, part of part of my life. You know, uh, a few a few antelopes, you know, here here and there, and of course, fish in the in the river when we went swimming. When an, an opportunity came to, to select a, a, a course, it, it wasn't very difficult for me to choose wildlife management and later environmental planning and management. And then I worked for the Wildlife Service, a national NGO in Kenya called African Wildlife Conservation Center, and later Birdlife International. I, I led a campaign in, uh, at some point to save the Kenyan flamingos, if you like, because the site where they, they, they breed in Tanzania was under threat by the Tata group of, of India. Lake Natron in Tanzania is the only breeding site for our lesser flamingos. The flamingos you see in, in Lake Nakuru, in Lake Bogoria, all the way to, to Ethiopia, and in Tanzania itself, all breed at one place. It's called Lake Natron. And the Tata Group wanted to put up a 450 million US dollar factory, soda ash extraction factory that would destroy that site. And it would become ineffective for for lesser flamingos. So I led a campaign comprising of 56 organizations just before I joined Bad Life, 56 organizations globally that included Bad Life at that point, which later was mainstreamed into Bad Life. And we did campaigns, we did petitions, we did uh, public meetings, we did presentations uh, in boardrooms and we, we went to international conferences and we did all sorts of uh, lobbying and, and canvassing and eventually that project was so shelved and uh, the lake and the flamingo was, was, was saved. Looking back I do not regret because I read later studies were, were able to show that the economic benefits of preserving the lake, promoting it for, for tourism and promoting local livelihoods were going to be eventually and in the long term uh, long term, much higher than putting up a 450 million soda ash factory. 
that's the story of my life. That's the story of my of my career. And here I, are, I am uh, uh, coordinating uh, a policy, climate, and communication. Please tell us more about you know this human one life coexistence and why it's actually very crucial at this point in time. I work for Bad Life International, the largest network of conservation organizations in our in, in the world. One hundred and twenty civil society organizations in 116 countries and 26 of those are in Africa. So we strive to protect biodiversity, uh, birds and the areas that are important for them, working with the local communities, so encouraging sustainability by also working with, with, with governments. Birds are a critical indicator of our environment. Uh, you can call them the barometer. They uh, tell us the direction in which environment is moving and by extension, the direction that humanity is, is, is moving. So if we damage the areas that are important for birds, then those are also the areas that are important for, for people. Because these are the wetlands, these are the forests, these are the grasslands that are critical in providing ecosystem services that sequester carbon that also prevent flooding when it rains. So a peaceful coexistence between humans and nature and biodiversity and birds is, is critical. When you take care of biodiversity, we are taking care of ourselves. When you damage biodiversity, when you damage birds, when you, when you damage wildlife, we are damaging ourselves and our future and the future of, of, of our children. But I'd like to mention one key issue that is topical uh, today, climate change. Birds are showing us the direction that we are all going to if we do not change our ways. Birds are changing their movements, they're changing their ranges, uh, and that is the areas where they are found, that you find that you know, a certain species of the bird was found in a certain area, but it has moved because the, the, the things have changed, the climate has changed. And therefore, they are the first indicators that things are not okay. So we must take care of them, we must take care of nature, we must take care of our university, and we must coexist. Actually, Ken, that's a very important point you bring there. I, of course, I remember even in the olden days, I mean, the birds would actually be used actually to predict, you know, how the climate and how the weather patterns are actually looking. Uh, down in Nakuru, we've seen, you know, movement of the flamingos, perhaps in Lake Nakuru, maybe to signal, um, you know, onset of rain or to signal, uh, you know, a, a additional population of the birds. So critically, as you put it, we need to um, ensure that there's a peaceful coexistence onto it. And maybe just delving a bit deeper, how do we enhance that uh, peaceful coexistence? Peaceful co coexistence can only happen if we value the services that are provided by birds, wildlife, and nature. If uh, we, you and I, and, and the other person appreciate the role that they play in our environment, in nature, in our lives, we will be able to, uh, to do what it takes to ensure that they are protected and they are, they are preserved. There are many things that harm nature, very many of them. For example, you find that in Africa, we have about uh, 2,300 species, you know, species of birds and 245 of them are classified as globally threatened. And 183 you know, of these, that is 75%, are threatened by agriculture. And logging affects 49% of those species. And you know, they are other other things that damage the, uh, the areas that are important for, for birds, for example, some people are seeing a lot of uh, infrastructural developments across areas that are critical for, for birds and for other top forms of biodiversity. In Africa, the program for infrastructural development, creating more than 40 development corridors, is huge and it's going to, without a doubt, affect uh, some of these the, the critical areas. You've heard about uh, the road through uh, Abadeas National Park. We know about the, the SGR through Nairobi National Park. This morning, I was uh, conversing with someone about Fomi Dam in, in Guinea. It was going to threaten thousands of hectares of, of, of land that is useful for people and also for, for biodiversity. And therefore, uh, how we coexist and how we ensure that our development and our activity to not impact these areas is by ensuring that they are safeguards. How do we ensure safeguards in our infrastructural developments? How do we ensure safeguards in how we grow our crops and how we harvest them? How do we ensure safeguards in how we, we do our housing and settlement? Are we building our houses 
inside wetlands? Are we reclaiming west, wetlands and river systems uh, in order to develop? And therefore, uh, striking a balance in how we do our development is the answer to how we then we can ensure that birds and biodiversity and, and nature are, are, are protected. But you find a, a, a huge push. Uh, it's almost like an order to all against nature. Uh, we find nature being obliterated, you know, in most most places. So I think um, uh, the long and short of it is ensuring that you have safeguards, and secondly, ensuring that you have a balance and thinking about nature as we think about development. Appreciate what you say there. Uh, you know, looking at it, can thinking about nature, or they think about development. So then, how do we strike uh, the balance? If you say now, let's have the safeguards, let's have the balance. And I'm, I'm, I'm asking you as a policy expert. You know, sitting in in these critical boardroom meetings where this really happens. You know, what, what would you tell them? And, and, and you mentioned about, you know, the SGR, which is, again, a regional project. Uh, you mentioned about the um, projects that are actually being done in partnerships with other countries that even touch on, you know, the wildlife uh, coexistence, particularly the national park. So you're sitting in the boardroom and you're talking to these African leaders. What, what would you tell them? We, we are living in, in great times in terms of policy development and what and the, the global mechanisms and frameworks that governments have committed themselves to uh, in terms of protecting uh, nature, protecting biodiversity, protecting wildlife and bats. And we have the Sustainable Development Goals, which is the blueprint for ensuring that we fight poverty, we fight hunger, we ensure sustainable urban development, but also, on the same breath, protect the life on land, address the climate crisis, because those, those are also parts and parcel of this sustainable development goals. So that's a commitment that the global community has, has made. Over and above that, the global community has also gone ahead and committed itself to and prepared documents uh, and frameworks to protect nature and biodiversity. The most recent one is the Kunmin Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework. So that document that was signed in Montreal in December 2022 is a bl blueprint of how the global community is going to uh, to stop and to halt and reverse biodiversity loss uh, by 2030. The reason why this is critical you know, is urgent and critical is because a million species, you know, this time not just birds or uh, insects or other things, a cross section of you know, of different types of organisms, a, a million species are sliding toward ex extinction. That is data that we have. So there are targets that are looking at what are we going to do about the areas where biodiversity is found? What are we going to do to, to prevent sli as, as species sliding towards extinction? What are we going to do to restore the areas that are already degraded? And the global community has committed itself to protect and to better manage to um, restore 30% of seascapes 30% of degraded ecosystems and, and landscapes by 2030. So if you look at that within the, the prism of development, if you're seated there as a government uh, minister or as an investor in infra infrastructure or a multilateral development bank, and I would say, yes, we do need development. We do need to meet the needs of a sustainable development goals. But then on the other hand, how do we mainstream the needs of biodiversity in all these plans and processes. How do we ensure that global biodiversity framework is part of, for example, Kenya's development plan, the development plan of the city of Johannesburg? How do we ensure that that is done? So unless we, we do that, then we'll continue with development as usual. We'll continue with our, our usual meetings. We'll continue with our usual discussions. And 2030 will be here. And we haven't put in place systems to make sure that we protect biodiversity as we develop. Thank you very much, Ken, for those great insights. One of the most important lessons renowned conservation hero, Professor Wangari Madai, left us with is that preserving our environment is a collective responsibility that requires active engagement from everyone. Let me bring in Mr. Stephen Ogutu, who's Executive Director at Movement for Community-Led Development in Kenya. Please tell us more about MCLD and the work that you do, particularly in conservation. Great. Um, 
Again, it's really nice to, to, to join you, Laban, on this very timely podcast. What MCLD is all about, now we are a, a global network of uh, civil society organizations that was founded in 2015 in, in New York uh, alongside the, the SDGs. And the reason why we performed is because for a long time, development has always been tall bottle where government officials, development partners, you know, just decide what to do, decide uh, to come up with policies and development initiatives without really listening to what communities want. And so when that happens, the result is always white telephones or projects that do not address the pressing needs that citizens or communities face, whether it's climate change, food insecurity, and things like that. And so while we exist is to challenge that narrative and say that enough is enough. It's time that community voices are heard and that communities are put to be at the center and front of the sustainable development conversation. So that's how we formed. And now we are in 17 countries across Africa. We are in, in Mexico. And of course, our founding country, which is the U.S. Steve, I'm sure you have quite a number of success stories tucked under your belt. Based on your interactions with different communities, maybe you can share your most memorable success story and what are the factors that contributed to this success? Uh, for us to achieve any sustainable development, it's really important that we include community-led uh, development approach. And in Kenya, maybe I should have said this, uh, we started our operations way back in 2019. We are collaborating with county governments to address a number of issues, including conservation issues. We are registered in Kenya as a membership and you um, having over 60 community-based organizations that are engaged in a number of activities. For example, a county like Taita Tabeta. 65% of Taita Tabeta counties is occupied by both Savo East and Savo West National Parks. And the result of that has been a growing human wildlife conflict. And uh, it told us we are, we are coming up with an initiative that is looking at how can we address this conflict, this human wildlife conflict. I had a chance to speak with the governor a while back. What he mentioned is for a very long time, I think conservation efforts, especially on wildlife, has really focused on wildlife welfare at the expense of the human losses. Because he mentioned that there's, there's a whole village or two that are in the corridors of where elephants move and, and lions. Nearly 30 or so percent of, of people or women there have been left widows because their husbands have been trampled upon or, or beaten up by, by the lions. It, it's just a very, very sad story. And he gave me an example, by the way, of a group of women, three of them had gone to fetch firewood. And as they were heading home, they came across, they met, you know, one on one uh, with uh, an elephant. And then two women managed to, to run, but then one was trampled upon. It appeared like a baby elephant had actually sunk into some shallow well near where the, 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 these women were. And so the elephant was just coming to, to check. I was very aggressive around that area to check on, on its baby. So this woman died. She was trampled upon. Later that evening, actually, there was a, a helicopter that came to take uh, this baby and I found a way, you know, and really given care and treatment and all that. But no one seemed to bother about the life of this woman, you know, and then the kids that they offered the kids that she left behind, you know. And so that really speaks to the need for conservation efforts to also include community led development approaches. Let's listen to communities. Uh, before designing any interventions around community conservation and things like that, it is very, very important to listen to communities because development happens in communities, whether it's conservation development, 
uh, whether it's biodiversity conservation and, and, and whatever type of development be happening in communities. And so if we want them to be sustainable, then we have to really hear their voices. Like what does sustainability mean from their perspective? Now, therefore, when there's that ownership of communities, then we are able to see uh, sustainable progress in some of these um, areas. And so what we is the request for us was, you know, how can we design an initiative that is looking at not just addressing the, the wildlife aspect of things, the welfare bit of it, but also looking at the socioeconomic impacts that comes as a result of this conflict. And so we are currently approaching a number of partners to look at how can we advance this ethos because it's a reality. Um, so many orphans, so many widows, so many widowers um, as a result of this. Thank you, Stephen. Great use of examples there, I must admit. Um, I now want to just look at the future of it. It's said that the future starts with the next generation and uh, with education, we are empowering our youth on deciding what kind of world they will live in. As MCLD, how are you empowering our children and the youth to be the next generation of conservationists? One of the things that we are focused on as, as MCLD is, is a concept called the mindset change. And we have a number of trainings that we are running around a mindset change and even in, in conservation. And we are saying that it just doesn't need to be mindset change for the youth only or the communities, but all across the, the partners across the, the conservation ecosystem, whether it's the dollars, government, and, and people like that. And so for the youth, I think it's um, really, really important that those all those involved uh, in this conservation efforts, that we focus more on that mindset shift among the youth, that conservation is also our role, that if we don't step up to mitigate some of these challenges that are facing us, uh, whether it's on climate change, whether it's um, uh, on animal conservation and, and all that, um, that we really lose it. But also beyond that, uh, that we are also doing with the Tiger Tabeta County and Makoene County government and a number of other development partners, it is what we are calling the tapping into the indigenous knowledge. For a long time, this has been missing. There's been an urge to, you know, try out new things, you know, move to work modernism and we leave behind, you know, the indigenous knowledge that kept our forefathers and the communities before us healthy and, you know, there's such an indigenous knowledge that they used to conserve the environment, to live with these wild animals and things like that. But that seemed to be missing. And one, one of the things that we're actually doing with Taita Tabela County a partnership with the Taita Tabeta University very soon is around, we've just formed a technical uh, research group that is looking at uh, researching different aspects of indigenous knowledge, including on conservation and how this can be instrumental in uh, advancing the conservation efforts. Um, and this is important because if this is not documented, if it is not researched upon and documented, and pass to the next generation, then I'm afraid that we will uh, we will lose it. So that's where now collaboration comes in. I know we're in talks with the uh, ABCG to see how we can uh, scale up some of these efforts. You know, they have such a huge network, not just here, but across uh, Africa. I, I think we need to avail partners, development partners um, and, and governments need to avail funding uh, to, to grow to a youth less uh, conservation efforts, because that is where we have the right energy. That is where we have the right innovation. Youth are very innovative, they're very energetic, and we have to tap into into that resource. As we wind down our podcast today, maybe just let me move into your parting shots and hear what you have to say um, as as we close. So let me start with Ken. Uh, thank you, Laban. This has been a, a great uh, interaction. I absolutely agree with, uh, with Steve. Any conservation and even development efforts that ignores or glosses over the needs and aspirations of the local people are bound to fail. So my first take is that whether you live in Nairobi 
or, or Cape Town or Kigali or Dakar. You eat food that comes from the surrounding ecosystems. You drink water from those ecosystems and you breathe fresh air that's generated by those ecosystems and probably take medicine that's taken from those or similar ecosystems. So when you protect those places and spaces, you're protecting your, your source for, of food, your source of water, your source of fresh air, and your source of, your source of health. So indeed, protecting nature is pro protecting your well-being. Secondly, governments must, must see nature and biodiversity and what is wildlife as a partner in development. Protecting biodiversity and nature is not a hindrance, it's not a barrier uh, to development. The needs of nature, the needs of biodiversity, the needs of birds and other wildlife must be mainstreamed into our development and planning processes. And thirdly, we must respect the needs and the aspirations of local communities and local people. Because indeed, they are the first-line custodians of these places and spaces and wildlife and, and biodiversity. And therefore, their involvement must indeed be effective. We must stop the culture of tokenism. You provide one small project there, talk to two or three people there, and say, I have involved the community, I have helped the community. So, involvement and participation of local people must be effective. It must be deliberate and it must include them from the beginning to the very end. Thank you. Very well. Steve, over to you. Oh, sure. And and Lebanon, it's been really, really nice having this conversation and hearing from my co-panelists uh, lots of insights and nuggets of wisdom share there. But I think for me, my parting shot is if we were thinking about sustainable conservation, one, we must seek to, to include the actors within the conservation ecosystem, whether it is communities, development, government officials, that mindset change is very important. And that mindset change should include looking at things from a bottom-up approach. And then finally, tapping into local knowledge or the indigenous knowledge as it's now, this can be a silver bullet when it comes to addressing uh, some of these uh, conservation challenges. S something that maybe I, I should have mentioned is we have just established an initiative in collaboration with um, Makueni County. Uh, it's called the, the, the School for Community-Led Development. So this is a school purely for community-led development. And uh, it's the first in Africa, uh, second in the world after one that we established in Mexico. And the aim of this is we're targeting development partners, county governments, and national government officials, uh, training them on various approaches to include the community-led development issues in the design, implementation, and evaluation of development initiatives. And one of the areas that we, we are big on that in, in that curriculum is conservation efforts. And we're happy to have partners like MBCG who we in talks with to see how we can advance that, that beat as well. Thanks. Thank you once again for joining us today, Ken and Steve. It's uh, been a truly enlightening conversation. Thank you, Lavin. Thanks, Lavin. Throughout the episode, we've learned that our conservation heroes are working tirelessly to find innovative solutions and raise awareness about the importance of balancing urban development and the wildlife ecosystem. Their efforts are not only benefiting the ecosystem, but also enhancing the quality of life for urban dwellers. Let us remember that fostering a peaceful coexistence between wildlife ecosystems and urban development structure is a shared responsibility. By supporting organizations, volunteering and adopting sustainable practices in our daily lives, we can all contribute to creating a harmonious future for both humans and wildlife. That concludes today's episode of Breathe. Stay tuned for more inspiring and thought-provoking discussions on our magnificent planet. Don't forget to like, share and subscribe our social media pages. Until the next episode, remember to breathe. Enjoy and take care of our planet.
I've been your host. My name is Laban Cliff Onserio. See you in the next brief episode.